My name is Bruce Baer, Dean, UW College of Forest Resources. On behalf of the college, I wish to welcome all of you to this three-part lecture series entitled Sustaining Our Northwest World from Fire to Flowers. Our intent in the series is to highlight the dynamic balance we seek in meeting the growing natural resource needs of society while sustaining the environmental, economic, and cultural values we associate with our urban and wildland resources. This lecture series is a companion to the college's Denman Forestry Issue Series, also seen on UWTV, and both series contribute to the college's vision of world-class leadership in sustaining natural resources and environmental services throughout the region in order to improve the lives of future generations while satisfying the needs of people today. Most natural resource decisions are complex and oftentimes contentious. Thus, good solutions require that objective science be used to weigh the ecological, social, and economic consequences of decisions in order to meet the desired balanced result. All three values must be considered to achieve sustainability and to ensure the proper stewardship of our natural resources. We are pleased to present this lecture series as a partnership between the University of Washington Alumni Association and the College of Forest Resources. We are also grateful for the support of the Rachel A. Woods Endowment, which is underwriting a portion of this series, and to the members of the college's Dean's Club for their financial support. I encourage you to contact the college at www.cfr.washington.edu to explore the broad nature of natural resources and to learn how our college plans to educate the next generation of natural resource scientists and leaders while creating and leveraging new technology to sustain the social, ecological, and economic values of our Northwest world. Managing wildfires in the West is a very timely and relevant issue because in the United States and Canada, forest fires have increasingly become more severe and widespread after decades of well-intentioned fire suppression. Millions of acres of forest are at risk of catastrophic fires. Finding solutions involves the use of complex tools and thorough analysis, all based on sound, objective science. Despite increasing fire risk, finding the most appropriate ways to sustain the health of our forest remains a very contentious issue as we enter the 21st century. Effective forest policy requires social acceptance and trust in the many communities and user groups interested in forest policy development. Policy reforms driven by objective science provide the proper approach to the eventual solution. Today, we are fortunate to hear from a nationally recognized leader in this critical area of forest management and fire ecology. Dr. James Agee will present his vision for forest management practices that are intended to yield healthier, more fire-resistant forests. Professor Agee is a nationally recognized expert of fire ecology and is a professor at the UW College of Forest Resources where he holds the Virginia and Prentice Blodell Professorship. The title of his talk is Forest Aflame, Strategies and Challenges for Managing Fire in the West. As the title of my talk uh, may suggest, uh, the West has a large fire problem. And uh, although the West has always had fire, uh, the level of catastrophic fire that we've seen in recent decades uh, is really unprecedented in history. Uh, even in the 1950s, while we still had a fire suppression policy, we were burning about a million acres a year in the West. And in recent decades, particularly the last decades, it's averaged about four million. So it's about four times as much as, as occurred uh, halfway through the last century. Uh, the states of Washington, Oregon, California, Arizona, Colorado, 
have all had the largest fires in their recorded history uh, in the last 10 years. But unlike other catastrophic events, and particularly those that we've seen recently, earthquakes, tsunamis, volcanoes, we can manage the intensity of fire disturbances, at least in some places, to reduce some of those catastrophic effects. And that's really the, the topic of my talk today, is uh, to define to some extent the nature of the fire problem that we have in the West, uh, briefly talking about how we got there, uh, some of the options about what we might do, and then some of the opportunities and, and barriers uh, to, actually, to actually getting there. But I'd like to outline at least a couple principles that are key to a solution that will come up, I think, several times during my talk. Um, the first is that in forest ecosystems, the only constant is change. And what that means is if we choose a, a non-active or a no-action kind of alternative uh, in terms of our western forests, uh, that particular management strategy uh, will be associated with change. If we choose instead an active management type of policy, that's also going to be associated with change. So we have change uh, regardless of what we do. And uh, I think uh, I'll, I'll hit upon that a little bit uh, later. Secondly, ecology is a science of place. Uh, the kinds of fire problems that we have across the West are not the same everywhere. And we probably need to think about strategically prioritizing the kinds of, of, uh, of management actions that we might, might think about. In some areas, infrequent and very high intensity, what we might call catastrophic fires, were the norm. Uh, they always burn that way, and they burn that way now. But some other forests that are burning that way now, particularly what I call the dry forests, um, historically burn quite frequently. They burn with low intensity. Uh, if you would, kind of they burned as the friendly flame, cleaning up fuels and doing very little damage to the mature trees. The question that we really have is, can we somehow restore, at least in local places, a semblance of those kinds of conditions to begin to mitigate this kind of severe fire that we've had in the last decades in, in these kinds of forests? We began this fire exclusion policy with the best of intentions about the turn of the 20th century. Uh, the idea was that if we were going to uh, finally get control over forest management, we needed first institutions and then we needed plans. The institution that most markedly changed forest management in the western U.S. was the creation of the Forest Service in 1905. And in 1910, uh, there were a series of, of very large fires in Idaho and Montana. Uh, it was the first time that, that firefighters actually hired by the government were killed, about 88 uh, were killed in those Idaho and Montana fires. Uh, and it began a, a major push, uh, essentially, to control nature. It was interesting that the same month that these fires blew up and created most of their uh, uh, death and destruction, that the philosopher William James, James published an article uh, that suggested that instead of warring against each other, that what we really needed to do was to have a war against nature, that we needed to control nature. And it was essentially the moral equivalent of war. And this began a, uh, about a decade-long debate as to what we ought to do about fires in the West. Uh, it concluded in the 1920s with the idea that even these light fires that moved around the forest floor across the dry forests of the West needed to be put out because they killed small trees that would eventually become large trees. And at the time, we didn't realize that we might end up actually with too many trees on the landscape and really change the character of, of how those forests function uh, in terms of, of how they cycled water, uh, how they acted as wildlife habitat, and particularly how fire interacted in these particular forests. The next four slides are a sequence shot from about 1908 to 1948 uh, in a typical dry forest. This one happens to be in western Montana. I want you to imagine the way a forest fire might burn through a forest of this type. You see the widely spaced trees. Uh, there's a lot of distance between the forest floor and the canopy, an absence of what we call ladder fuels, that is fuels that will allow uh, fire to creep up from the, from the ground up into the crowns of the trees. 
And a very lush understory composed of grasses and forbs and low brush species. There has been just a bit of selective logging in this particular forest type, but the cover of that understory suggests that this has been a fairly open forest. And there were probably 50 million acres of forest like this across the West um, back at the turn of the century. After fire exclusion, this next slide is 1928, and it shows not only more trees, but a different species of tree coming in in the understory. Those overstory trees are almost all ponderosa pine, and those little guys coming in in the understory um, are, uh, are Douglas fir trees, uh, slowly coming in and replacing those other trees. 1938, another 10 years later, you can still see those three big ponderosa pines kind of in the foreground, but you can see that the understory is beginning to kind of fill in again. 1948, essentially we've created a tree jungle uh, with probably a, a couple of orders of magnitude additional trees than were there 40 years previously. And think about a fire burning through a forest like this. This is the, the characters, characteristic of many of the western forests that we have today. Uh, a lot more dead fuel on the forest floor, uh, a lack of green understory fuels like the grasses and shrubs we saw in the historic forest. Lots of these ladder fuels that can carry these, these fires that begin on the forest floor up into the crowns of the larger trees. So it's no wonder that we really change the character of fire. And when fires get started in these areas, uh, it's much more difficult to control them. Back in that early forest, the way that the first rangers went through and controlled those fires was to walk up to the edge of the fire and uh, uh, tie a pine bough to the tail of the horse and walk the horse along the edge of the flames. Now we sit back 10 miles away, shoot retardant on it with airplanes, and hope that the weather changes. Now Smokey's been given a lot of blame for this. Remember, only you can prevent forest fires. Uh, in fact, Smokey's kind of been, uh, in a sense, demonized a little bit. Um, <laughs> but perhaps unfairly. Um, fire prevention always has and always will be an important part of, of the fire management picture. Uh, we need to put fire where we want it and we need to keep it out of, of other areas. There were a lot of other things that we were doing in the forest as well. One of the things we did was to take out the largest, most fire tolerant trees out of the forest, the ones with the tallest crowns, the ones with the thickest bark, the ones that tolerated those frequent low intensity fires uh, better than, than uh, uh, either other species or smaller trees. Another thing we did was, at least in the early portion of the 20th century, had essentially an unlimited grazing policy. Uh, as many animals as you could fit out on the range uh, went out there. Uh, this had some major impacts on some of the understory species, uh, but another thing it did was it churned up soil and made it a really good spot for trees to regenerate. And the fact that the understory vegetation, the grasses, forbs, shrubs, were you know, of lowered vigor because of the kind of grazing that was going on made it easier for trees to get established. If we look at the interior west types of forests, we see that there's been a major shift in the severity of fires. Uh, those uh, uh, pictures on the, on the left there uh, with kind of the red colors indicate uh, the amount of high severity fire or these more infrequent uh, but, but types of fires that kill most of the trees in the stand. Historically occurring about 20% across that landscape and now occurring at about 50%. Conversely, on the, the, the other end of that spectrum are historic low severity fire regimes uh, occurring of about 40% of the landscape and now down to less than 20. And there's a third category in there if you add that third category of kind of the mixed severity fire regimes which are intermediate, you, you end up with kind of 100% there. And if you look at that on a landscape level, this is the interior Columbia Basin. The green areas uh, on the left uh, show the historic low severity fire regimes with the, uh, the red showing the high severity fire regimes. And then how those have changed is shown on the right uh, under, the, under the, the label called now. 
So because forest ecology and fire ecology is an ecology of place, uh, we can kind of characterize most of our forest types into one of these three broad historical fire regimes. The high severity, mixed severity, and low severity fire regimes. And our opportunities and probably priorities for restoration of these forests uh, can also be classified by looking at these fire regimes. And I'll be going through uh, brief examples of the high and the mixed severity fire regimes and spend most of my time on the historical low severity fire regimes where both the changes have been most significant and our opportunities for restoration uh, also hold the most promise. So if we take a, a typical high severity fire regime like our coastal western hemlock Douglas fir type, uh, grows here around Seattle. Uh, the average fire return interval in these types of forests was probably two to 400 years. And uh, oftentimes when they occurred, they were very, very large. This particular watershed is out of the Olympic Mountains, and it probably has an age class of Douglas fir here, probably about four or 500 years old, that uh, regenerated after some very large fire event of the past. These are typically warm and wet at lower elevation, and other of, of our high severity fire regimes are some of our subalpine forests uh, that tend to be uh, relatively cool and wet. So when we think about active management for fire in these types of forests, uh, the case here is a little bit more difficult to make than in the drier forest types, primarily because fire risk is low. Our fire return interval is very long. We can walk into many stands where a fire has not uh, uh, entered that stand for as much as three or four or five hundred years. So risk of fire is relatively low. Now if you had a development right next to one of these forests, there might be some opportunities to do the kinds of techniques that I'll talk about a little bit later. But as a general rule uh, across the broad forest, uh, it tends to be a lower priority uh, issue, not so much fuel driven as in the, as in the drier forest, but oftentimes uh, driven by unusual events, either unusual weather, or very unusual kinds of circumstances. Uh, one of these to just briefly mention was many of you, particularly with the, the big earthquake in Indonesia, uh, have been hearing about this uh, large subduction earthquake that we had along the Washington coast about 300 years ago. Well, it turns out for a long time we've known about these large forest fires that occurred in 1701, 1702 uh, in these same coastal environments. And we were trying to figure out what that tie was. Was it a climate tie? And, we're not really sure. It, it's very likely that what happened was that large quake, because it occurred in January, uh, wet forest soils uh, probably had a lot of quake throw, and essentially you had a lot of slash uh, created on these sites, natural slash, from all these trees that, that fell over. So if we look on the Eastern Olympic Peninsula, for example, there was a large fire that apparently burned all at one time from Shelton, clear up to Squim, around over to Port Angeles, and clear past Lake Crescent. Very, very large fires. And we've seen the same thing in some of the little coastal watersheds along the Oregon coast. Well, this is more of the catastrophic and unpredictable kind of, kind of event um, that, uh, that may occur. But clearly, the probability of this happening is, is much less than in our drier forest types. When we look at our big severity fire regimes, these are kind of intermediate in location between the kind of the lowland wet areas and some of our, our very drier forest types. Uh, they tended to have somewhat intermediate fire return intervals, ranging perhaps somewhere historically from about 25 to 75 years. And they tended to be relatively patchy in terms of their severity. So the top slide here uh, shows a fire burning in uh, 1978. And almost all that area that you see in the, in the, in the, the mid-ground there burned, uh, has already burned, and the fire is kind of burning around the edge. And the bottom slide shows the same uh, landscape about eight years later. And you can see a kind of a variegated pattern. There's some areas that burned hot enough that they killed all the trees, other areas where they thinned out the trees, and other areas that just kind of underburned where the fire did very little damage. And this is kind of very characteristic of a variety of forest types in what we call this mixed severity fire regime. So we have some very low patches of severity. We've got some where perhaps since these fires, you know, burn for oftentimes weeks to months, uh, you had periods of weather uh, that were a little drier or a little windier 
or maybe the slopes were a little steeper, and so the fires got a little hotter and killed more trees. And other areas that were even hotter. So at a landscape level, what you see is a diverse landscape composed of relatively small patches, perhaps several to, to as much as 50 or sometimes even 100 acres, but much smaller than in the high severity fire regimes, where you have this complex mix of high severity burning, where everything is killed, moderate severity burning, where it's kind of a thinning effect, and low severity burning. And over time, this created a kind of a mosaic of different species mixes and structures across the landscape, um, which I would argue probably had a lot of value for the wildlife diversity that we saw in those forests as well. So in the background there, that is the fire that we just took a look at. And in the foreground, you see a variety of different textures of forest. And these indicate the severity, differing severity levels, the more even textured areas are young even age stands that developed after a fire about 50 years previous to the, to the fire that we just took a look at. And then some of the more variegated textures uh, are areas that, that burned with lower severity. So active management for fire in the mixed severity uh, types of forest, I'd, I'd say that the case here is a little less difficult to make. Uh, our fire risk is a little bit intermediate, uh, clearly higher than in these high severity fire regimes. But they oftentimes tend to be in, in somewhat cool uh, types of environments where fuels might build up not quite so rapidly as in the dry forest types. So we have kind of a mixture here of, of these weather and fuel driven events. The poster child that I'm going to use for uh, forest restoration using active management is going to be these mixed conifer and ponderosa pine forests. Ponderosa pine is widely distributed across the west. It goes from the South Dakota, Black Hills, down along the, the front range of Colorado, through New Mexico, Arizona, to the Sierra Nevada of California, the eastern Cascades of Oregon and Washington, and many of the lower elevation areas in the Rocky Mountains. Sometimes these forests were pure forests of ponderosa pine. Other, types, other times they were mixtures of ponderosa pine with other conifers, Douglas fir, grand fir, white fir, and oftentimes other species that, of more local distribution. The historic forests managed by fire across these landscapes, burning across very frequently, uh, did several things that, that we can begin to mimic in terms of what we call now fire safe principles. These frequent fires reduced surface fuels on a regular basis, so there wasn't opportunities for them to build up before another fire came in. We know from historic fire scar records that the fire return intervals in these systems were probably somewhere between about five and 15 years, depending upon where you were. So it just didn't have enough time for a lot of fuels to build up before another fire came in and, and consumed those fuels. And in fact, where we see some fires occurring uh, in, in one historic year, pick a date, 1820, another fire coming in in 1821 or 1822 burned up to it and then went out. Now, if, if that interval was, was stretched out to maybe five to 10 years, typically then that whole area would burn again. But there was this opportunity to kind of buffer the way that fire moved across these landscapes. These fires killed a lot of little trees. Now, the early foresters say, well, that's a horrible thing. But really what it did, it prevented regeneration from occurring, except in areas where the overstory was killed. And typically, what was killing the overstory in these natural forests were pine beetles. They would come in and they'd take out the overstory in a limited area, uh, kill the trees. And as those trees would fall over and be burned up by subsequent fires, it would provide microsites for regeneration to come in. And that's where a new patch of regeneration would come in. Because of all the green up in the area and the grasses, sometimes fires would move around or be patchy and slowly thin out those trees. And then a new cohort or group of pines would develop in that same area. These fires also kept the largest trees because they were the most fire tolerant. So if we could somehow begin to restore some of those conditions of the natural forest, uh, we might have an opportunity then to begin to mitigate the large scale catastrophic fire that we've seen across the West in these drier forest types. One of the most widespread techniques uh, to deal with the surface fuels 
has been the use of prescribed fire. That simply means a fire that is ignited uh, under conditions of fuels and weather and topography so that we control its intensity and we can control its extent. Now, once in a while, we screw up and one of them gets away, um, but 99% um, of them get the job done correctly. We can even burn in very fuel-laden environments by selecting moisture conditions under which just a certain proportion of the fuel can be consumed under those moisture conditions. And so through a series of fires, you can take a very hazardous situation and make it very fire safe. By doing so, it limits the, the potential spread and intensity of a subsequent wildfire. Prescribed fires, as well as consuming fuel, also create fuel. And so if we were to use only prescribed fire as a restorative tool in these fuel-laden forests, uh, we would probably have to go in several times. And uh, at the same time, uh, we would be producing a lot more smoke, a lot more carbon, than if somehow uh, we could reduce some of those fuels uh, by mechanically removing them from the forest. But one thing that this fire does, this prescribed fire does do, is it does begin to separate the surface fuels from the fuels in the crown. So these ladder fuels that are carrying fire from the surface to the crown uh, somehow need to, to, to be reduced. We know what the, the characteristics of those fuels are that allow that transition to occur. It's a function of how high those ladder fuels are separated to begin with off of the forest floor. And it's also a function of their moisture content, which declines typically during the summer. And we can't do much about controlling the moisture content, but we can do something about this height to live crown. A prescribed fire can do that. We can go in and manually begin to prune up the trees, or we can simply remove some of the, lar some of the smaller trees uh, to increase that height to the live crown. So in terms of preventing this torching or this transition of surface fire to crown fire, we can do two things. One is to treat our surface fuels so that we reduce this flame length of a potential wildfire. And the second thing is to keep that live crown as high as possible off of the ground. And this is just a, a graph showing that, in fact, as you increase this height to live crown, which is shown across the bottom of the graph, that the flame length needed to initiate torching uh, increases as well. And so if we had a height to live crown of about two meters or six feet, it's only going to take about a three to four foot flame length to, uh, to have torching occur. Whereas if we move that height to live crown up to perhaps um, 20 feet, uh, it's going to take a much, much longer flame length in order to, for that transition to occur. Here's some example of how prescribed fire has, has um, affected these ladder fuels. Uh, that top picture is, is indicating a, uh, an area that's been prescribed burned about three months previous to, uh, to this picture being taken. And you can see that there's kind of a brownish color to the bottom of the crowns. Those are scorched needles that in the bottom graph, or excuse me, the bottom picture have fallen off the trees. It's the same stand taken from a slightly different angle. Another thing that, that happens as you begin to, to increase that height to live crown is a little more sunlight comes down to the forest floor. It greens up a little bit. And because of that extra foliar moisture on the surface, the kind of the ratio of the dead fuels, which tend to be a little bit drier, and these green fuels tends to make it harder for fires to move across the landscape. In the historic forest, which had a very well-developed green understory, most of those fires only burned it very late in the season, after these grasses had cured out for the year. You don't see very much burning that occurs very early in the season. The third element in terms of developing fire safe forests is reducing the density of the crowns of, of, the, of the larger trees. This is an important thing to address, uh, but it's probably not the first thing that we ought to address. The surface fuels and the ladder fuels are probably the, uh, the more important. By doing this, thinning is going to uh, reduce the mass of the crown, a, a, a characteristic or a parameter that we call canopy bulk density. And by doing so, it makes, it makes it harder for fire to jump from tree crown to tree crown to tree crown. And so an independent crown fire is much less likely to occur.
Now, there's a variety of ways that we can think about thinning a forest mechanically. And I'm going to go through about three of them here. And each of the graphs is set up about the same way. We have the diameter of the trees across the x-axis along the bottom, and then the number of trees uh, along the y-axis. And you see these in, in most forest management textbooks. Nice bell-shaped distribution or normal distribution of tree sizes. Uh, and if we were to do what we call a low thinning, we'd start off and we'd be taking most of the, the trees out that are shown in the green. That is, we're taking the smaller trees and leaving most of the large ones. So in the end, we're left with a bell-shaped distribution that's a little bit biased to the higher end of the size classes um, that were initially there. If we were to do a crown thinning, typically the very smallest trees and, and the very largest trees are left. Uh, and the trees that are taken out, again shown in green here, uh, are kind of in these mid-range size classes. And if we were to do a selection thin, we'd only be taking out the very largest trees. And of course, these have the most economic value because they are the largest and they have the, uh, essentially the most saleable value. So all three are going to be reducing this parameter that we call canopy bulk density. Low thinning, the one that I initially showed you and that's shown in the top here, uh, is the only one that's really going to increase the height to live crown because it's taking out those smallest trees and it's leaving all the large ones. But although these kind of look like, well, geez, the low thinning really ought to be the, the way that we go about treating these stands, in practice, uh, there's typically a lower merchantable limit that's, that's actually a, of commercial value. And so when we look at a, a, a more typical stand, which is shown by all of the columns there, uh, showing the density of trees across diameter, kind of set up the same as the earlier graphs, what we see is a different shape. It's not necessarily a normal shape, but it's oftentimes skewed to a lot of the small tree sizes. And that's pretty typical of, of the kinds of, of diameter distributions that you see in these uh, stands that are choked with small trees. So if we only take out merchantable trees, but start with the very smallest ones, we would be taking out essentially some of the trees, some to all of the trees in that mid-range size class that's kind of indicated by the red envelope there. So we would be left with the very largest trees in the stands still standing there, and also the very smallest ones, with really no effect on, on the height to live crown either. So. To illustrate the effects of this on fire safe principles, I, I, uh, I made a simulation of both thinning and burning. I took um, a stand that's a, a fairly typical kind of east side stand with some very large trees in it, but also a, very, a lot of very small trees. And the idea was to thin it down to kind of what we think about the historic structure of these stands was in terms of what we call basal area, or the sum of all the cross-sectional diameters of the trees in the stand per unit area. And that's oftentimes about 60 square feet uh, of basal area per acre. I applied four thinning treatments and two fuel treatments, either a prescribed burn or a wildfire. Excuse me, a prescribed burn or, or no prescribed burn. And so what we had in terms of our thinning treatments were no treatment would be one. Second one would be a low thin, starting with the very smallest trees, whether they were merchantable or not, and removing everything up uh, until our stand only had 60 square feet of basal area per acre left. A third one being a, an, another low thin, but starting at a commercially viable tree, so about six inches in diameter, and then thinning out the trees of, of up to in larger uh, diameter classes until we hit that same uh, basal area threshold. And then a selection thin, where we started with the largest trees and took those out, working to leaving the smallest ones. Then we applied a prescribed fire to reduce fuels or no prescribed fire. So we had four thinning options, two fuel treatments. Then we, in these computer programs, we simulated a kind of a worst case wildfire in the summer the kind that you hear about and see on TV. And here's what we found. Doing nothing in the stand, as we already know, uh, ended up having a, essentially a, a stand replacement effect. 
So the amount of green in each of these columns indicates the amount of live trees, essentially, that are left after treatment. Um, the UM over there on the left means unmanaged. Our selection thin, where we took out all of the big trees, uh, also didn't fare very well because the trees that were left had lower crowns and thinner bark. Where we began to use, utilize prescribed fire to do fuel treatment and where we left large trees had the best survival. And that's what you see moving over to the right. And in fact, I thought kind of unusual uh, in this simulation anyway with this forest structure, our unmanaged stand where we simply applied a prescribed fire, we didn't do any thinning treatment at all actually had the most in, ended up after this simulated wildfire, having the most basal area left of all of the treatments. So the take home points on these kinds of, of actions is that no action is a disaster. Uh, thinning from above, which means taking the larger trees and leaving just little guys, uh, that doesn't work out very well either. Low thinning is the best thinning method and prescribed fire is very helpful. Uh, but it probably has to be applied more than once to be effective. So these fire safe principles at least were, uh, seem to have been validated by these simulations that treatments that reduce surface fuels, that raise that height to live crown by reducing ladder fuels and kept the big trees did the best. Now we do have some empirical or just visual evidence that we can go out and look at areas that have been burned by wildfires that have been treated or not treated and at least make some, some other validations uh, of these kinds of treatments. We, it's very hard for us to do experimental crown fire work uh, outside of, of the Canadian border. Every time I've gone to a forest supervisor and said, gee, you know, how about giving me 50,000 acres that I can burn up in a catastrophic fire <laughs> and measure the temperature and, you know, see how many trees die. Um, well, yes, they did. Uh, actually, they've, they've done almost all of the experimental crown fire work, and some, some folks in Alaska as well. But almost all of the, the experimental evidence and theory of crown fire that we've developed has come out of Canada. So I'm going to go through a, several examples here just to show what was going on. The first are, are the hay fork fires that occurred in California in 1987. Um, there was past active management there. It was not done with fire safe principles. Most of it was overstory removal where they uh, simply were, were taking out some of the largest trees. Uh, but they left a number of fairly good sized one as well. And they did some areas with fuel treatment and some areas with not. The um, uh, kind of the height of the green in these graphs show the amount of, um, um, of mortal or mortality with the green being essentially most all of the trees uh, surviving. Uncut stands did the best because they had the largest, really big, old growth, fire tolerant trees. But the cut stands did okay too, as long as there was fuel treatment. And this would be a, a stand that essentially had no, no treatment and was burned by a wildfire, uh, but had a, enough of those larger trees that all those stems that you see in the foreground there all survived the fire that occurred about a wildfire that occurred about 10 years before this, uh, before this slide was taken. Another California fire, the Megram fire, which also occurred in the North Coast. They were able to, it, this followed a large uh, wind snap wind throw event in 1996, uh, which created a lot of tops and stuff like this on the forest floor. Uh, the Forest Service down there was able to go through and essentially do surface fuel treatment, getting rid of some of those tops. They didn't do much overstory treatment. And what you see here is a, a kind of a, the line between untreated forest where all those tops were left out there and a fuel break where they only dealt with the surface fuels and some of the ladder fuels. As you can see, it's a very dense crown and uh, they didn't really do much in terms of, of uh, manipulating the overstory. So these were stands that still had about 70% or more cover uh, within the fuel break. Uh, this is just the boundary, this is not two different slides. This is one picture with just a yellow line down the middle of it showing where the fuel break began and where it stopped. More close to home here, the Taiyi Fire, which covered uh, 120,000 acres in eastern Washington uh, in 1994, uh, an area of high lightning activity. Uh, 
Areas that had been treated, this stand on the left had been treated uh, by taking out only stems that were less than six inches in diameter. It was near a residence, and uh, they did it under a special use permit with the Forest Service. They pile burned the debris and limbed up the trees that they could. A crown fire came right up to the edge of this stand, and within about 50 feet of encountering this stand, dropped to the ground and underburned it as a surface fire up to the house, which was saved. And two months later, this was one of the few green spots on that landscape, and eight years later, it remains one of the few green spots on that landscape, which once was fairly heavily forested and now looks like Kansas wheat fields with snags sticking out of it. <laughs> Another area in that same fire, um, not quite as much survival as we saw in the other one, primarily because the scale of operation oftentimes was very small where they had done treatments. And uh, a lot of the heat from the crown fires moving across that landscape uh, not only scorched the, the, the trees from below, but the hot air moving across the top oftentimes scorched them from above. A, a kind of a, an effect that I call the BLT. You know, you have this little strip of green in the middle and then you got two pieces of toast on either side. Um, so scale is important. If we're going to do this seriously, we have to think about larger scales. One final example on the Taiyi. Uh, from the left, a crown fire was approaching this area that was, that was treated with these fire safe principles in the 1970s. A very thin strip, only about 200 feet wide. Uh, but they thinned out the crowns a little bit, they pruned up the trees, and they treated the surface fuels. This crown fire came up to the fuel break, immediately dropped to the ground, burned as a surface fire under that fuel break and immediately popped up as a crown fire on the other side. Now there's a little blue dot there, which is kind of a close up uh, where the next slide is, is shot. And that yellow line is the edge of the fuel break with the left being the fuel break and the right being the, the, uh, the crown fire area. The trees within the fuel break were also larger because once they were thinned out, the photosynthate that they were able to capture uh, from the sun was allocated to, to many fewer trees. So each tree that was there got larger. And this was about a 20-year-old fuel break. So on average, the trees in the fuel break were about 12 to 15 inches in diameter, and the ones outside were probably more like about seven or eight inches in diameter. So the ones in the fuel break were bigger trees. They had thicker bark and uh, fewer fuels. Probably not, uh, not unusual that they survived. Another California fire, the Cone Fire, 2002. This was an area that was within an experimental forest, and they were evaluating effects of thinning and prescribed burning on forest structure and wildlife habitat. Uh, in 2002, a wildfire came into their, their areas. They had just treated these areas. They were fairly recent within the last five years. Where they had done some thinning of the forest and some prescribed burning, the fire actually went out. It didn't even go into those areas. Where they had done some thinning with some lop and scatter treatments. That's where you essentially compact the fuels but don't really get rid of a lot of it. Uh, there was a lot more crown scorch in those particular fire areas. So the untreated area on the right, and if you turn around kind of 180 degrees, the treated area uh, on the left where the fire went out. And in this area, it took about 500 feet for the fire to transition from a crown fire down to the point where it was not doing any damage at all. So we can make those transitions. One last example, the B&B &B fire uh, in Oregon. Uh, this is the kind of the pre-treatment after thinning. After a prescribed burn in that thin stand. And after a wildfire went through that area, causing pretty much stand replacement mortality across much of the landscape, but not here where those fire safe treatments had been, had been applied. Just as a note of caution, uh, the Hayman fire, this large fire that occurred in Colorado in 2002, uh, had a, a, an amazing run during exceptionally severe weather. And the kinds of fuel treatments that I've talked about here didn't really have as much impact during that severe run of, of the fire, that one day where it ran about 18 miles. Uh, even areas that were treated suffered a fair amount of mortality. So fuel treatment was effective when the weather moderated, but with 70 mile an hour winds, 
uh, they still had a tremendous amount of mortality. So we know for the most part that stand level treatment, particularly if it's done at an appropriate scale, uh, will work. How much of a landscape needs to be treated? We're thinking maybe from a fire control perspective, if you really got forces out there on the ground, maybe 20 to 25 percent. If you're interested in, in uh, uh, treating more widely across the landscape, assuming that maybe those fire control forces aren't going to show up and you want some of that forest to survive, you better treat a larger proportion. How long will it be effective? Uh, we're going to have to come back and think about maintenance treatments. Um, particularly if you're going to use fire alone, it's going to take a couple of, of iterations with probably within a decade uh, to create a fire safe condition and maybe a maintenance treatment every 15 to 20 years uh, after that. Can we actually do this on the landscapes of today? Uh, there are a lot of constraints. Uh, whether they're real or whether they're perceived doesn't really make too much difference. Um, there's a fear of active management. You know, if, if we allow managers to go in there and cut trees, will they do the right thing? That's a real fear that people have. And uh, uh, it's something that's, that's going to have to be built up uh, with trust and by managers doing the right thing. There are perceived to be wildlife impacts of varying kinds. If we use thinning on a, on a wide basis, are there going to be roading effects, uh, soil compaction, other kinds of things? It's also going to be more difficult to do these kinds of treatments with an expanding developed zone or urban interface zone spreading out into wildlands more than ever before. And we're also going to be doing these in a changing world, a world of global warming um, and uh, where things like global carbon balance uh, may become a real driving force in terms of, of forest management. These are all risk management issues, and we do, in general, a pretty poor job of risk management and trying to assess these, um, uh, these types of issues. We've had a, a, um, a Healthy Forest Act, Healthy Forest Restoration Act passed uh, after the large Southern California fires in 2003. Um, I think it provides a good policy direction, but the devil is really in the details uh, of how those things are actually uh, play out over the landscape. It does specify that there should be a focus on small diameter trees, uh, fuel breaks, prescribed fire, um, and it does have some limits in terms of, of how widely it can be applied. And generally, it's supposed to be applied in these drier forest types uh, where the changes have been most catastrophic. A lot of it depends on funding. You know, we had a great opportunity for children with the No Child Left Behind Act, but it wasn't ever really funded to the extent that it should have been. If we're forced to do this with forestry operations, we may end up having something like the No Tree Left Behind Act. <laughs> but if we do it right, no forest will be left behind, and we'll actually have a more sustainable set of, of uh, forest structures widely across the West. This particular stand has been thinned, has been prescribed burned. You see that you've got some of that green up, kind of like in the historic forest. Uh, and this one is well on its way to surviving uh, a worst case wildfire if, if one comes in. The last issue I'd like to just briefly mention uh, before I'm closing here is this issue of climate change and fire. Uh, climate change by itself will have uh, impacts on how fires occur across the landscapes because they're going to have a lot of impact on the weather conditions that actually drive fires and also on their ignition through the distribution of lightning. Climate's also going to have an impact on vegetation change. And we've seen that in the, the paleo record. If we go back uh, thousands and thousands of years, we've seen that with changing climate that we have forest types that are moving across the landscape, either retreating downslope or moving upslope moving to the north or south or east or west. And the, climate, the kinds of climate change that we're going to have in this next, um, uh, probably occurring now, uh, but particularly over the next century, is going to have some major impacts on vegetation, which means that the fuel complexes might change. And this is also going to have interactions with, with fire as well. Generally, we know that temperatures, because of the increased carbon dioxide, are going to increase 
precipitation, depending upon what model you want to believe, is going to vary a little bit, uh, both in terms of, of how much comes down and its timing. Across much of the West, uh, a model called MAPS, which is the uh, Mapped Atmosphere Plant Soil System uh, model that's uh, being used now by the Forest Service, indicates that across the West, uh, it appears that, like there's going to be more carbon to deal with. We're going to get more precipitation. It's going to be packed more in the wintertime. And it's going to be a warmer precipitation. So it's not going to all come as snow, perhaps, as, as it does in some areas now. And so what that means is our fuel situation is going to, uh, is going to become worse. How are we going to deal with this? Well, we might deal with it through managed fire, like prescribed burning. But prescribed burning tosses more carbon into the atmosphere. Now, there may be a trade-off between reducing wildfire emissions and the use of prescribed fire. But that's a very complex set of trade-offs. If it, if it occurs at all, it may, have, it may have a rationale in the drier forest types, but it won't at higher elevations or in the wetter forest types. Another alternative is to harvest this extra carbon and use it as biofuel, converting it to some sort of, of, uh, of energy through a variety of different, um, uh, different techniques, and essentially offsetting the use of fossil fuel carbon. And then a third one is to harvest it and actually capture, capture that carbon in building materials, like two by fours, and uh, actually having it in buildings so it doesn't end up ending up in the atmosphere. So we know it's going to be a complex future. Uh, we've got the historical role of fire in these dry forests, which we might call the good. Uh, we've got what's happening now, which we might call the bad and the ugly. Or we can think about a restored forest using active management. We know, we know the principles that should be applied. Can we apply them? Will we apply them? I believe that a sustainable future for the dry forests of the West depends upon active management and a commitment to do the right thing, a land ethic at its best. Thank you.